I just love that. I just sit there and go right there with her. And everybody laughs at me, especially the front row, which is actually the third row. <laughs> Joyce, thank you tonight for coming and in, in ministering to us in song. You were blessed. It's a blessing to be able to sing for the Lord. And I've chosen to sing tonight, His Eye is on the Sparrow. And in Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 through 31, it says, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Discouraged. Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is He. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know. your heart be troubled his tender word I hear and resting on his goodness I lose my doubts and fears though by the path he leadeth but one step I may see for his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know. That went perfect with Sunday school, didn't it? Yeah, his eye is on the sparrow. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Amen. Amen. Well, I have 18 minutes to get you out of here. <laughs> Some of you aren't buying that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll get on with what he's laid on my heart tonight. Our Father in heaven, Lord, as I prepared to bring a message, it's a simple message that you've allowed me to have tonight, but I thank you for it. And I thank you that it's a role model message for each and every one of us here in your house tonight. And Father, we just pray now that uh, we might do you justice. But Lord, we know that all are going to be in justice. And I thank you that my justice is bathed in the blood of my Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name I pray. Amen.
Well, you know, tenacity. Do you remember, you know, you remember, uh, uh, oh, her name just skipped me, uh, the such and such show, Lou Grant. Mary Tyler Moore show. She's thanking Mr. Grant because he goes, Mary, you got spunk. She goes, well, thank you, Mr. Grant. He goes, I hate spunk. <laughs> uh, uh, that's, that, I thought that was funny. <laughs> Way back there, whenever it was, the 60s, something like that. Tenacity. I like tenacity. And, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about a little bit about tenacity. But I want to talk to you about the tenacity at Antioch. And, and so if there's a title to the message, it's Tenacity at Antioch. And because it was a great, great thing. Uh, this morning I shared with you a number of things about uh, Saul and the conversion of Saul. And, and he became Paul and the things that he had to say. And as a pattern for us that he penned those things down. A pattern for you and I. But tenacity. The church at Antioch was full of tenacity, which was good stuff. And, and if you don't quite understand what tenacity is, I, I, I penned down a few definitions. Tenacity is, is, is a, it's, it's a persevering mental state. Um, it's moral strength to resist, operate, to, to, to resist opposition, danger, or hardship. But to have tenacity, it requires something. It requires courage. And it requires a firmness of mind and will in the face of danger or extreme difficulties. Courage to support the unpopular and go against the grain. It requires metal. You've got, you ever hear anybody say, you've, that guy's got metal or that lady, metal. It requires metal, a capacity for meeting, uh, to meeting a strenuous situation or difficulty. Uh, with fortitude and resilience. And it's a challenge that will test your mettle, so to speak. And, and, and it requires spirit. It requires spirit. Uh, it requires a quality of temperament enabling one to hold one's own or keep one's moral turpitude when opposed or threatened. That's what it takes for tenacity. Those at Antioch they held their, to their beliefs and they served, they served that church and they served that God with great, great tenacity in all of those adjectives that we've used to describe that. You know, you remember the scene as we spoke about it this morning. You remember the great persecution that those found in the way were in this morning. You remember the stoning of Stephen and Saul holding the coats and Saul getting the letters from the chief priest at Damascus on the road to Damascus to, 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 to capture those and, and the, those that were found in the way and to do what with them? To do what with them? To capture them, to take them hostage, to take them back. Uh, and and uh, even at the peril of their lives. Uh, so, so many, many things were going on here. The, our first Christian martyr is stoned to death. And, and so Saul's holding the coats for everybody. And then he's out there persecuting uh, those found in that way. And, and, and we know that God will and can, under, I think when I use the word can, it underestimates God. God will use evil for good. He will use that evil for good. And we see that went to build the tenacity that took place at the church at Antioch. Antioch was a wonderful place. What a role model church for us tonight uh, in that tenacity. God uses evil for good. We know that he took out the bully, amen? He took out the bully. And we know he did that. And then he did something else. Is he scattered? He scattered those found in that way. God took evil used it for good. He scattered them. Turn with me, if you will, please, over in the book of Acts to chapter 11 tonight. The book of Acts chapter 11, this time I had you in chapter 9 this morning.
And we're going to watch how the hand of God works and how the tenacity builds at this church at Antioch. And, and as we look at chapter 11, join me in verse 19, please. Verse 19 of Acts chapter 11. And I'm going to, be, as I direct you to other scriptures, hold your spot in that book because we will come back to this one. But as we look at, we see in verse 19, now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenis and Cyprus and Antioch. And what did they do, church? They're preaching the word of God. None but unto the Jews only. And I'm going to stop you right there and ask you to go over to Luke chapter 2 with me. Uh, you, I've used this during the, the, the Christmas season many a times. But in Luke chapter 2, if you'll go over there and particularly look at verse 25 with me. And again, I've confessed, every time I read this, I get, I can, I get chills. I, I, I do, I get chills when I read this. And I hope you do too. Verse 25 says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. You see, at the time that this old man Simeon, at the time of this old man Simeon, it wasn't like the church age that we live in today. Today, when somebody comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and lets him in, after he knocks on the heart's door via the Holy Spirit testifying of Jesus, when you open the door and you let him in, and you repent and turn away from your unbelief, the Holy Spirit follows right in behind. You just open the door, and the Holy Spirit is rode right in there with Jesus Christ. And we're given the Holy Spirit inside. But not so in the day of Simeon. Old Simeon, but he was just. And he was devout. And he was believing that his eyes would see the salvation of the Lord. Because he believed that because the Holy Ghost told him that. Not only did the Holy Ghost come upon him. Didn't come in him. Came upon him. Holy Ghost came upon him and told him these words. Told him this, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, this is a cool, cool passage of scripture. What nuggets I find in here! And he came by the Spirit into the temple. He came by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit directed him to the temple, and that's how he went there. And as he went to the temple, and when the parents brought the child in to do for him after the custom of law, then took he up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us, thou thy servant, depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Revealed to old Simeon by reason of the Holy Ghost coming upon him. But, but wait, which thou hast prepared, prepared before the face of all people. Now watch this. Very special verse. A light to lighten the Gentiles. Isn't that... I, I'm going to tell you what. That verse right there. You stop and think about baby Jesus. They've taken him into the temple. He's not an adult. He's not doing miracles. He's not curing diseases. He's not raising people from the dead. He's not gone to the cross yet. But he's going to be a light unto the Gentiles. You think about Matthew chapter 10 and I'm not going to turn there. But you think when Jesus brought his 12 disciples together and he gave them power. He gave them power for that, that limited time to actually cure diseases. And he sent them but he said Go where? To the lost sheep of Israel. Not by way of the Samaritans. Not by way of the Gentiles. None of those things. But here's old Simeon when Jesus is a child saying he's going to be a light unto the Gentiles. Wow. Wow.
Verse 33 says that Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken to him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall. And here's the resurrection. And rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul, that the hearts of many hearts may be revealed. They didn't understand all that at the time. But what prophecy... And so here we see, by the scattering and all the terrible th persecution of those that were found in that way, those that are like Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 11 that I'm going to take you back to now. When we see that, we see in verse 19 again, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that rose about Stephen, traveled as far as Venice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only remember Simeon. He's going to be a light unto the Gentiles. You see, you can't hold back the gospel. And we see in verse 20, and some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the who? The ah, the Grecians. And what were they doing? Preaching the Lord Jesus. Simeon's prophecy is being revealed right there when the Holy Ghost come upon him. Not to Jews only now. They may have started off with that intent in verse 19, but now it's all of them. And the word of God's going out. So we see in verse 21, here's the great thing about the tenacity of these folks that come to make up this church at Antioch. Verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. A great number believe. Why is that? What happened? What were these guys doing? This great tenacity is these guys were going out and talking about Jesus. And what was the result of that? A great number believed. You know, the bride of Christ is the chariot that's carrying the bride of Christ through this world today has got a whole lot of mud caked on the wheels, folks. Really slowing it down. The bride of Christ isn't getting out and talking about Jesus. If the bride of Christ was talking about Jesus, more people would be believing. But the bride of Christ isn't doing a real good job going out and talking about Jesus. So we look at the tenacity that comes together with this church of Antioch. They had, they, in verse 22, because they were going out and talking about Jesus. Now listen, think about this. Think about, these, think about what has just happened. They're scattered. Why are they scattered? Because of the persecution. Why are they scattered? Because Stephen's been stoned to death. Because of his testimony for Christ. Saul, what he's doing. This is all the things that's went on. This is why. That's adversity. So don't tell me that the bride of Christ can't go out today and talk about Jesus. They could do it under those conditions at Antioch. So Antioch is a great role model church for us tonight. These guys in verse 22 had to send for reinforcements. And, and what a lovely thing. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Here comes the reinforcements. And we look at verse 23, and there's even more fruit. Who when he came and was seen, the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. And we see in verse 24, for he was a good man and full of, this time, full of the Holy Ghost. We're, we're in the New Testament age, we're in the church age. The Holy Ghost isn't upon him. He's full of the Holy Ghost. And being full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, much people were added unto the Lord. Amen? This church is taken off under adversity. And, and with great tenacity. And now they're, they're exhibiting more fruit, but now they need help. Now, it's so bad there that they've got, they've got to call for even more help. Barnabas was sent. More people are added unto the church. But look at verse 20, 25 with me. Verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek for that rookie convert Saul. Yeah, Saul's been saved. 
We covered that this morning. He's, he's been converted. And now they're going to go at, they're going to Tarsus to seek out Saul to bring him to Antioch so he can help. They need a rookie to come back and help. That's how much tenacity they have there going on at the church at Antioch. So they go get him. And we see that as they go get him, in verse 25, they departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. And they taught much people. And disciples were called, what? They were no longer people found in that way. They were called Christians first at Antioch. My church family, you got your handle at this church. You got your name at this church at Antioch in the scriptures. You've got your King James Bible from this church at Antioch. You see, the manuscripts that this was written from came out of Antioch. All of this West Hort and and, 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 and the, the garbage that Westcott and Hort used uh, came out of the Alexandrian text. And let me tell you something. God hated Alexandria, Egypt. You'll find that in the scripture. Um, he uses that as, a, as, a, as an analogy or a parallel many times. His own people were drug around for 400 years and wouldn't even be buried there. He didn't like that. He didn't like Egypt. Poor Paul, who used to be Saul, he was shipwrecked. He was beat. Where would all this happen to him at? Alexandria. Study it. They didn't like him. They didn't like him. So we see here in the scripture, in verse 26, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church, and they taught much people. We see, we see the tenacity at the church at Antioch. The first thing I see here at the church of Antioch is that they were not afraid to leave church on Sunday and go talk about Jesus. And as they went to talk about Jesus, and the simple thing, the simple conversation of, hey, can I tell you what Jesus did for me? Can I tell you what he did for me? As they began to do that, their fruit began to multiply. More people came. You know why our pews aren't totally full? We're not telling enough people about Jesus. That's why. We're not using the tenacity of, a, of our role model church at Antioch. We're not using the, the tenacity of the role model church where we got the name Christians. We're not using the tenacity of the role model church that gave us our word of God in this King James Bible in our English tongue. We're not using this kind of tenacity in the bride of Christ. That's why we're not filling God's house because we're not getting out and telling people Jesus, what he did for me, what he did for me. We're leaving him locked up in the church house and not taking him out. Oh, we're believing in him, we're talking to him, we're praying, but we're not sharing him and we're not telling people. That's what we need to do. That's the tenacity that they had in this church. They assembled. You know, we're not, telling, we're not telling backslidden Christians, Christian, do you realize the tenacity at the church of Antioch, the pastor was showing us in the scripture, they assembled together. Without that, we're nothing. Without that, oh, we'll go to heaven, but without that, we're nothing. We have no, if we don't assemble together, we have no tenacity. We're lacking if we do fail to assemble together. We tell our weaker Christian brothers and sisters who say that they're Christians, but if you're Christians, then you should be assembling together. Where are you at? Where are you at? Come on, assemble together. Because, you see, they had to assemble together. And then what did they do? Well, we see in verse 26, he had found him. He brought him unto Antioch. It came to pass a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. And what they have to do? They had to teach much people. They had to teach much people. They brought Saul back to help teach all these people they've been telling Jesus about. Well, if we don't assemble together, there's nobody to teach. If we don't assemble together, who's going to teach? Right? So, when our backslidden Christians, we need to be telling them, listen, this is the role model church. This is what we're to be doing. You're buying, you're buying a false bill of goods if you think that you can't be, you're not supposed to be in God's house. 
when the doors are open. That's what we need to be telling the backslidden Christians, the people who don't know about Jesus. We need to be able to tell them what Jesus did for us. What he did for us is what we need to be able to say to him. We need to be able to understand that this is where we got our handle. This is where teaching and learning takes place. This is, this is how God's plan is. He uses the local church, just like he did at Antioch, to do this. By God's hand, he founded a church at Antioch. They struggled through difficulties. They became men of enormous faith there. They shrugged off the I can'ts. They shrugged off the discouragement. And they proceeded with great tenacity out of that church. We look at verse 27. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch. More preachers came. More preachers came. You got one here. You got one here. I wish we, I wish we could use three. But we have one. But I wish we could use three. We could use three if we filled these pews by telling people about Jesus on the outside of the church. Amen? The tenacity. If the backslidden Christians who call themselves such are truly saved, if they heard from us that, you know, only people in the local church can hear and respond the way God expects them to. Only the people in the local church can hear and respond the way God expects them to do it. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, in these days came prophets from Jerusalem and Antioch, in verse 27. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. There's going to be a great famine. There's going to be a lot of hunger that's going to go throughout. How, where? What does the scripture say? It said all the world, all the world. However, but, the, but, but when we look at something, then the disciples, that's the people who are sitting under the teaching, then the disciples, every man according to his ability determined to send relief to whom? To the brethren which dwelt in Judea. The tenacity of this church at Antioch it, w it was just terrific because only those that are in the local church can hear this. Only those that hear it can respond to it. All of these missionary flags hanging about the sanctuary tonight, only the people that are in this church, only the people who are faithful in this church and giving can respond to these missionaries the way God pleases. A, a backslidden brother or sister in Christ that's not in the local church can't do any of that. They can't hear it. They don't know the need. They can't respond to it. They can't do any of those things. They cannot do any of those things. What tenacity this church had. God bless all of you folks that are faithful like the people at Antioch. This is our role model church here. If there's a role model church in the Bible, it's this one. We know that. We know that only those in the local church can hear this. We know that when we look at verse 30, which also they did, and they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. We know that in, in, in supporting our missionaries. If you look at Galatians chapter 6 with me, and we're moving down to a close. Galatians chapter 6. I was running against the clock, folks, trying to get us there, but... Galatians chapter 6. And oh, how there is absolutely no footing anywhere in this Bible for a man or a woman to call themselves a Christian and forsake the house of God. There is no footing anywhere in the Bible for this. Nowhere at all. But there's lots of times that the Lord tells us his plans, how things have to be done, and he tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together in the manner of which some do. Some do. We need to go after the some do's in these last days. We need to be able to tell people about Jesus. We need to be able to understand this church had great tenacity. And look, what, what, look what, another thing that can't be done outside of the house of God. Take a look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. We see in this passage of Scripture, excuse me, I have confidence in you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, as we have therefore opportunity, 
let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now, you can't do that when you're outside the doors of the household of faith. And what tenacity this church at Antioch has shown us tonight. They talked about Jesus, and those who heard were reached. The church grew larger. They had to send for reinforcements. They were faithful. They assembled together. They were taught together. They learned together. They learned of the brethren who needed help, and they responded in kind accordingly. And the church, the folks just didn't come to church. When they left, they told Jesus how Jesus paid for their sin. And then more fruit came. So the question tonight, can you be a Barnabas and a Saul? Maybe I should say a Barnabas and a Paul. Can you be a Barnabas and a Paul? Can you tell people about Jesus? Because that's what started filling that church at Antioch. That's what made them have to call for reinforcements. That is what the Lord used them for, to send help out to the brethren, the household of faith. That's what we need tonight. That's what we need in our days ahead. Uh, Brother Adolph's going to come. We're going to close in a verse of song. That's what we need as the bride of Christ I say this tonight to show us the tenacity, if you want to call it our mother church, we can do that. Um, in the book, great tenacity, under persecution, under fire. And they adapted, they improvised, they overcame, and they did what they had to do. I get excited when I read that. I put myself in that position and I think this is good stuff. This is great stuff. And, and I like to be known as one in the Lord that has tenacity for God. To be able to say, okay, let's go do it. Let's go do it. Let's go do it. I, as I was, and I don't mean to embarrass anybody. I don't mean that at all. I mean to give glory to the Lord for this. But when I was reading this and praying and studying... There was a brother in this church that kept coming to my mind. And he's right here. Right there. And I'm going to use him for a second to glorify God. Not to lift him up, but to glorify God. He struggles to get out of a vehicle. He falls down once, twice, three times. Even before he gets to church. Sometimes he's here, he falls down. Sometimes he takes somebody with him. Right, Evelyn? <laughs> He still stands up and testifies. He still gets out and comes to an altar. You know why? Tenacity. That's a picture of tenacity. I was trying to come up with a picture of tenacity and I couldn't get away from that. I couldn't get away from that picture of tenacity. So I thank God that he's given us a picture of tenacity in you, brother. It's not you. It's what he's planted in you. And he'll plant that in each and every one of us if we'll let him do it. If we'll ask him for it and stand with him, he'll stand with us. You know, the Holy Ghost came upon old Simeon. But the Holy Ghost was in Barnabas. And there's nothing more powerful on the face of this earth than the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Ghost is in you and you listen, you can get tenacity like Brother Larry has. And we can have tenacity like that church at Antioch. And we can leave the church and the rest of the week when we run into somebody, we can say, hey, you know what? Have I ever told you how Jesus died for me and paid for my sins? And when I go to bed at nighttime, I don't even have to worry about any sin that I've ever committed. Thanks for listening. You don't have to wax all prophetic. You don't have to 
be a great theologian to tell somebody that Jesus died for you and paid for your sins and it don't matter what you did, what you're going to do. It's over. It's done. It's paid for. That's what God wants us to do. He wants that simplicity in Christ to be told. Because when, they, when they're told that, that's when they come and then they want to learn more. Then they assemble. Then they get taught. And that's the order it's done. We go out and tell them about Jesus. They hear it. They come. We assemble. We teach. They learn. Amen? That's the tenacity of our role model church at Antioch. Let's stand and sing tonight. If you need to come to this altar and pray tonight, you can come and pray for thank in thanks. You don't have to come in sorrow. You can come in thanks. You can come in thanks. You can come looking for tenacity, whatever the need might be. If you need someone to pray with you, come. Give me your hand, and we'll take your heart to the Lord tonight. Three hundred.